Thank you very much, uh, John, for the introduction. Um, the, the issues raised by John, I will address them later in the Q&A session. I'm really here to deliver a keynote speech on reforms in Malaysia. Um, so bear with me, it should take about 20 minutes. I'm really more comfortable talking during Q&A, but I suppose this is a must that I have to do, so I'm going to start. So first, uh, I want to thank ANU for organizing this and uh, John uh, to take the place of Ross. I wish Ross all the best and a quick recovery. And Dr. Noah Diana, who insisted I make this trip by sending me about eight emails. Uh, Kevin Ling, uh, Professor Tony Milner. Uh, since it's supposed to be a new Malaysia, so let us start with disclosures and transparency. Now, Kevin Ling, uh, Kevin, perhaps you can stand. <laughs> Kevin Ling was my former intern. He worked a lot on the asset declaration for Invoke. Uh, you know, so congratulations, Kevin. Uh, Professor Milner is my neighbor in Kuala Lumpur has been uh, bugging me for the last five years to come to ANU to, to talk and to meet the people. But before I continue that, I just want to add that I spent a lovely, wonderful weekend with Tony and Claire in their farm. Uh, but, you know, we were desperately feeding cows uh, with hay. The, the region is facing the worst ever drought in 60 years, that's what Tony tells me. I had to witness a pregnant cow, uh, unable to stand, it had to be put down. So I'm not sure why your government is not doing much about this issue. But when I return to Malaysia, I will have a good chat with my good friend, the Agriculture Minister. And uh, if you can ho offer any help, we will try to do that. Uh, because after all, Malaysia is famous for its cows. Our treatment of cows are legendary. One of our former ministers bought condominiums to house them. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's a truly great honor to be finally here. And today I want to talk about reforms, hope, challenges in the new Malaysia. Let me start by giving you a short description of what the old Malaysia is. What is old Malaysia? The old Malaysia is a semi-authoritarian state where corruption became part of our culture. The old Malaysia is where crony capitalism influences economic policies and economic thinking to keep a large majority of the population underpaid and relatively poor. The old Malaysia is also where race and religious issues are constantly brought up by politicians to mask the corruption and abuses of power that is constant. The old Malaysia did not happen overnight. It took some three to four decades in, in the making. The majority of Malaysian voters in the old Malaysia, some of you are old enough to be in the old Malaysia, I see, um, agreed to put aside their rights, their democratic rights for a shortcut to economic prosperity. If not for the endemic corruption, we should be a very prosperous country today, a bit like Singapore, a bit like South Korea. Some three generations of Malaysia, Malaysians lived through this period. The elderly, uh, now elderly, but baby boomers, the millennials, and my generation, the Gen X. The Gen X, I must say, started off as corporate yuppies. I was a corporate lawyer. We started as corporate yuppies in the late 1980s and then 1990s, who then became angry reformists in the year 2000s onwards. We witnessed and bore most of the scars of the old Malaysia. The young millennials don't really understand. Yeah? So how do we go about dismantling the old Malaysia? As a Gen X politician, I know what needs to be done. And I will discuss the challenges we face now. I will share what I believe are the three most important reforms that we need, political, fiscal, and economic. I will give my views on the issue of timing. How fast should these reforms happen? I will also provide my observations of the first 138 days of the new Malaysia. Lastly, I will talk about what my office is trying to do to contribute towards the new Malaysia. First, the disclaimer, as a lawyer I should do this. Let me be absolutely clear from the onset, I do not speak on behalf of the Malaysian government. I am not a cabinet member. While I remain the policy technocrat for PKR, providing ad hoc views to two ministers and the deputy prime minister, I am not an official government advisor. So the views expressed here today are my own, and it's a bit ironic that in the new Malaysia, I have to put that disclaimer in. Now let's go to the reforms. There are 101 things that we need to do. But for the purposes of this speech, I will only highlight what I personally believe to, the, to be the three most important ones, one for each category of politics, fiscal, and economics. It is my belief that the single most crucial political reform to kickstart all other political reforms is the one great and good thing that we must do to implement policies to comprehensively eradicate corruption. Until we tackle the culture of corruption, the executive, 
and members of parliament will be unwilling and unable to develop the necessary political will to carry out all the other reforms. So how do we tackle corruption? Well, we can learn from the Singaporeans. I know we don't like to say that. But we can take their core principles on anti-corruption and adapt it to the Malaysian model that we build ourselves. So basically, all the, core, all the best policies in the world use a carrot and stick approach. So what is the carrot and stick approach that we need to do? First, we have to ensure that members of parliament and political parties are financially compensated so that they are no longer desperate and forced into corrupt practices. Secondly, to implement full asset declaration coupled with a fully independent and professional anti-corruption agency, the MACC. Once you ensure politicians and political parties are reasonably taken care of, plus a heavy and certain penalty for misbehavior, believe me, we will see our politicians miraculously develop the will to, to undertake the reforms ahead of us. Therefore, the lack of political will is the greatest challenge for reform in the new Malaysia. If we do not fundamentally tackle corruption, I fear that the new Malaysia will be dead in the water and overtaken by political developments and maneuverings in the coming years. And I think John, I had a quick chat with him, he understands the issue, I think. Yeah? Let me elaborate the anti-corruption measures a little bit more. As I said earlier, we need a carrot and stick approach. The carrot is better pay, better remuneration, and better support of resources for members of parliament. The pay should not only be sufficient for personal household expenses of the Member of Parliament, but also must be designed to develop their political career. So the current pay of the Malaysian Parliament, Member of Parliament is roughly 8,000 Australian dollars per month. To administer and operate his, his office or his or her office, the Member of Parliament is given another 5,600 Australian dollars per month by the federal government. Now is the pay adequate? Are the resources sufficient? The answer is no. The actual taxable salary of the Member of Parliament is only 2,000 US dollars per month. The rest are in the form of non-taxable allowances. So what it means is that the future pensions of Members of Parliament are inadequate. So the corrupt culture of making hay while the sun shines is actually embedded in the Member of Parliament pay structure itself. Yeah? What are the expenses of a typical Member of Parliament? Most of us have to donate 20% of our money to the political party. So I donate 20% to PKR. In addition, the typical politician will need at least three operators to look after, to develop his or her political career within the party and within the entire Pakatan coalition. So if the member of pays each of these political operators, say, 1,600 Australian dollars a month, that's about 5,000 ringgit Malaysian, the member of parliament will bring home a net miserable amount of $666 to his spouse, his or her spouse. The current pay structure, therefore, is inadequate, and in the real world of real world of politics, the money is desperately short. So, financially desperate politicians will actively seek patrons and cronies. This is the old Malaysia, which is still we are still being paid the same rate. So, what about the money for operating the constituency office? At five thousand six hundred Australian dollars a month, the member of parliament can employ only three officers. My office, we employ three fresh graduates. At a thousand US dollars, a thousand Australian dollars a month, uh, and we basically kick them out after two years because we cannot increase their pay. Yeah. So the remaining two thousand six hundred Australian dollars then used to pay rent, utilities, and other overheads. So what is the solution? It's quite simple. It's just money. You have to add another roughly eight thousand Australian dollars a month to support an MP, but it will go a long way to ensure that honest politician can at least remain not desperate and try to remain as honest as possible. So let's do the numbers. What is, good, what is it going to cost the Malaysian government? Is it going to cost the Malaysian government a lot of money? It's not that bad. It's 8,000 Australian dollars, which is roughly 24,000 ringgit, multiplied by 12 months, multiplied by 222 members of parliament. It brings you a grand total of 64 million ringgit a year in additional cost to the Malaysian government. And that is a mere 0.02% of the Malaysian annual budget, national budget of 280 billion. The other main cause of corruption comes from political parties directing their politicians who are in power or in any position to raise money for the political party. My office has calculated the cost of operating an, an established political party like PKR. It is roughly 1.7 million Australian dollars a year. 
PKR also needs to save an additional 1.7 million Australian dollars a year to build an election war chest every five years. So a political party like PKR really needs about 3.4 million Australian dollars or 10, 10 million ringgit a year. It does not need 50 million. It does not need 200 million. It definitely does not need 2.6 billion like Najib. So if political parties continue to seek donations to raise money, we will continue to be stuck in the murky world of undue influence of politics and money. The new Malaysia can and must much do must do much much better than this. That 10 million need, need, needed for to operate a political party must instead come from the federal government directly. The, this direct funding will enable political parties to decouple from the crony capitalism model. My recommendation is the federal government pays five ringgit, roughly 1.6 Aussie dollars, for every vote gained by a political party in the last election. For instance, based on the 2018 numbers, PKR will receive about 10.2 million as a federal grant. DAP will receive the same. AMNO will receive a slightly less now, at close to about 9.8 million. Some 12 million votes were cast in 2018. Therefore, the total government expenditure is a, is a mere 60 million. So you take 12 times 12 million times 5 ringgit each, is 60 million a year. That's another 0.02% of the national budget. So what we're proposing here today to cut corruption is a mere 124 million or 0.04% of the yearly annual budget. So the two earlier policies I told you are basically carrots to pay the, the politi politicians well, pay, pay off the political parties so they don't have to go and do dodgy deals. Now we talk about the stakes. Yeah? There are basically two sticks. The small stick is the asset declaration of all MPs and senior officials. Some of you may know who follow very closely. We have to declare by the 1st of October. I've declared mine. Now I have to declare my wife's. That's dreadful. <laughs> so uh, public de declaration. Uh, let me give you the simple example of what really happened. When we talk about public asset declaration, Dr. Mahade had a great idea. He said, all the MPs declare to me then I will then go tell the MACC, the Anti-Corruption Agency, what those numbers are. We say, no, thank you. Don't. I don't think that should be the way. So this is the thing I want to stress. We must do the political uh, push and pull. And then finally, we got a concession. So the, uh, the public asset declaration is less than ideal, but it's not too bad at the moment. Uh, I'll take a question on that later. Okay. So the second biggest stake is to ensure that MACC is completely independent, that it reports to Parliament and not the Prime Minister, that it is allocated a decent budget directly from Parliament, from the budget, and not through the Prime Minister's department's budget. Even the appointments of senior MACC officers has to be done by a parliamentary standing committee and not by the Prime Minister. Now, that's the end of the anti-corruption part. Let me talk about the second uh, fiscal reform that I want to talk about. Uh, put simply, it's really about ensuring wages for the poorest Malaysians must go up. Currently, only 15% of the 15 million strong working population actually earn enough to pay any personal income tax. 85% of the working population do not earn enough to pay tax. The threshold is 1,000 Australian dollars a month. It is appalling. We are a big oil and gas producing nation. But 85% of us do not earn uh, more than 1,000 Australian dollars a month. The poorest bottom 40 of the working population are underpaid. They are underpaid because our laws have not adopted any international labour organisation. Well, it has adopted some, but it hasn't ado adopted all international labour organisation rights. So even the best educated are relatively underpaid, which is why there are so many Malaysian professionals here in Australia and also in Singapore, Hong Kong, UK and America. So we need to bump up the pay for the poorest Malaysians. And we can do this by a co-pay system where the government pays half and the corporations pay half, or we can just legislate ILO standards into the labor law. So higher wages will result in higher personal income tax revenue for the government, and that is going to be crucial for the new Malaysia to balance its books. In the new Malaysia, corporations will need to end the culture of obscene profits and capital flight, because after they make the money, they buy houses in London. Only then can we as a nation get out of the middle income trap. As for reform number three, yeah, we've dealt with the first two. My wish list is the top economic reform wish list, which is to create a level playing field for businesses to prosper. I used to be a corporate lawyer, so this is uh, quite close to me. 
Uh, but you know, we, it, it does have social purposes that we want to pursue. We need to ensure that our government-linked companies, our GLCs and government-linked investment companies gradually exit the market. The preferred exit plan is not the old Malaysia's privatization policy, which is in real sense is a piratization exercise that made 10 to 20 families extremely rich in Malaysia. In the new Malaysia, we need to adopt a management buyout structure to create a large new upper middle class of professional owner managers. So instead of 20 tycoons, these MBOs will create, we are expected to create 100,000 upper middle class owner managers. And in order to ensure the MBOs are priced properly, we need again that the regulators, the lawmakers, to be ex absolutely corrupt free, clever, and capable. So the restructuring of the level playing field is going to be the biggest economic multiplier for corporate Malaysia. However, to do an MBO exercise, it will take between three to five years to implement. Pending that exercise, we go back to the issue of corruption. And that issue of corruption is how can we introduce anti-corruption measures and bring back good governance so that we get what we call a massive democracy dividend. How do we get a democracy dividend? We got about 1.5 million Malaysians overseas. Uh, half a million Malaysian executives are running the Singapore economy. That's why they're so successful. If each of these overseas Malaysians have assets or savings of say 100,000 US dollars, it's quite reasonable to expect that. Then the actual amount of money outside Malaysia that is controlled by Malaysians, overseas Malaysians, about 1.5 trillion US dollars. Now, if we pursue democracy fully, and we eliminate corruption, we should be able to attract 10%, that's a very conservative number, 10% of overseas Malaysians to return with their assets. That means the democracy dividend we're looking at is a staggering 150 billion US dollars, 600 billion ringgit, or roughly 200 billion Aussie dollars. That injection of capital flow will ensure a stronger ringgit and an endless supply of money to the natural business capabilities of Malaysia. And we all know Malaysians are all entrepreneurs. So let's now discuss the issue about the speed. So those are my three reforms that I really insist that the government must do. Now let's discuss the speed of these reforms because you know, it, they, they've got different time scale. Now I just want to say that I used to be a corporate lawyer doing mergers and acquisition. So when you buy a company, when you take over a company, it takes about roughly six months to two years to finally merge the corporate culture and the financial numbers between the two entities. Now, for the corporate culture, it's, it's very fast. It's about six months. The guy that acquired the other company will bring a certain culture. You have to kiss, kiss, the, kiss the boss in a certain way. <laughs> That's basic corporate culture. And then about one year to two years later, the financials merge and then you streamline it. Now, if you use that as an example, a timeline example for the Malaysian government, then what we have to do is we have to bring the management culture or governance culture of the new government by introducing anti-corruption and pro-democracy reforms. That must be done within nine months, six to nine months of election retreat. As for the fiscal and economic reforms, the mergers of the, uh, the cash flow and the financial management, that will take a bit longer than the corporate side. It will take about five years because when we inherited this government, we found that the government is extremely high in debt, weak in revenue base, had a culture of extravagant spending, and overall poor, dis poor fiscal discipline. So fundamentally, at a fiscal level, the current revenue uh, base is very pro problematic, with the personal income tax itself only contributing 12% of the entire revenue of the government. On the other end, we spend, we use all our oil and gas money from Petronas. We use it as a means to borrow more. And uh, you know, this is not good, this is not the Norwegian way. So what we have is we have aggressive borrowing where the national debt is now, as we speak, close to about 720 billion. So we come to the simple assessment now, the last stage. What have we done, uh, you know, what does it look like after our historical and exhilarating victory 138 days ago? There is still a lot of goodwill. And I'm sure the previous speakers in ANU, Tian Chua and uh, Kit Siang, they all gave you that story. Yeah, a lot of goodwill, a lot of happiness, everybody's kumbaya. Here are the good things, here are the good things that we've done. We have uh, basically charged Najib for one MTV. We have eliminated the GST. We have repealed the anti-fake news law. That's very good. We have decided to provide asset declarations, but some bits are still lacking. 
We have provided some savings for housewives, we have stabilized the price of petrol, we have given some breathing space on student loans. Now the negatives. Withholding equal resources to the opposition is not a good thing. You know, I get paid more than the opposition. That's crazy. The self-righteous attacks on LBGTQ community, that's shameful. The threat to cancel BRIM, which is the cash handout program for the poor. A minuscule increase to the minimum wage, a mere 50 ringgit increase. Declaring the use of cyanide as safe for mining activities. Uh, these are examples of missteps. Retaining the official secret sack is very worrying. You know, producing wrong fiscal numbers, stopping payments on projects, are also causing a neg negative ripple effect on business confidence in Malaysia. However, on the balance of things, I believe that with this, that these early missteps can be addressed as the cabinet gains in experience. Now, let me address the issue of implementation of these reforms. We talk about three reforms. We talk about the timing. We talk about the early success and early failures. Now let's see how to implement these reforms. There are basically two parts, the civil service and the parliament. I see some of the civil servants have decided to make a trip here. I had a really happy, successful meeting with them on Friday. Uh, so thank you for coming. And uh, I just want to reassure you what I told you is true, that we need to re-engage and retrain civil servants. And the best approach is not to blame or scold, but to empathize and to forgive and to work towards a common goal. Now, I've observed as a PAC member, public council committee member, I've witnessed many officials from a variety of ministries feeling a bit lost and with very low morale. They don't know where to go. So what we have to do is develop a clear game plan on how to reinvigorate the civil service. It has to be a combination of pay and it has to be a combination of accountability and structure. Now, What's the euphoria of our excellent victory wears off? And I'm predicting this to be sometime around Christmas. I can answer questions why I predict this around Christmas. The messy work of democracy and democracy building will need to pick up in earnest. The push and pull of politics and the reawakening of constructive criticism that's been dormant for about 100 days will require a meaningful and effective platform. What better platform for that than parliament itself? So what is my office doing for the new Malaysia? I'm coming to the last seven pages of my speech, so hang on. Uh, I was recently sent to represent Malaysia MPs for an ASEAN meeting. I was also appointed to the Public Accounts Committee. It has been decided by those in power that my role in this term is to focus on parliamentary work and matters related to the Malaysian parliament. That is in fact a very good thing because now I don't have to spend all my time writing economic policies, but to think a lot deeply about reforming parliament, something that will give, that will have a much longer and more fundamental impact to Malaysia. So we are very honoured to have this, uh, this role uh, put on to us. So what we do is we spend two, 24 hours a day, 24-7, on a medium term project to restore full parliamentary sovereignty. The aim is to reform scope and duties of parliament, so that parliament can then become a tool to positively influence a cultural shift from the old Malaysia to the new Malaysia, and what we do is we've proposed this. We are going to create nine new standing committees. Now, it will come as a surprise for you, there are only five standing committees in Malaysia at the moment, four of which deals with the rights and privileges and the, the rules for members of parliament. Yeah? There's only one that is effective, and that's the PAC, and the PAC is the only one that has a bit of budget and they can question the ministers. Now, we have zero standing committees to directly monitor ministries. We have 25 ministries, very large. There is also no standing committee on very important subject matters such as inequality, human rights, artificial intelligence, nor climate change. We need to change all that by creating these standing committees with real proper budget. What I want to stress is the implementation of reforms, whether it be corruption, anti-corruption measures, or economic policies, this should be driven by parliament via standing committees. Because we have to go back to the fundamental rule on separation of powers. Where parliament legislates the reforms needed, the executive then implements these reforms. The key is to create a system and culture of permanent standing committees with adequate resources. And to that end, we've been working very closely with the Norwegian government. We've just completed our proposal paper and we propose basically nine standing committees with a budget of 11.4 million a year. So, this is it. In summary, 
we have to uh, do a lot of reforms in Malaysia. After 138 days, we still have a lot of goodwill, but the pressure to perform and deliver is mounting. So members of parliament must start to take a more proactive and constructive critical position to provide the push and pull process to ensure that the Malaysia, new Malaysia's reform agenda continues beyond political posturing. The key to reforms is to fight corruption. The time frame for anti-corruption reforms must not exceed nine months. The tools to implement these reforms is an invigorated civil service led by parliament with nine new standing committees. The direct cost of implementing these reforms is 64 million to wipe out desperation from members of parliament, 60 million to support political parties to do their job, 11.4 million to create nine new standing committee. That's a total of 135.4 million or 0.05% of the national budget. It's half of a 0.1%. So what I'm telling you, why I give you all these numbers, is to dispel this idea that, that this is a question of money. This is not a question of lack of money, but a very human question of political will and the true commitment to the new Malaysia. Last Friday, I came, I came in on Friday morning. Friday night, of course, Kevin decided I, I should have a packed program. So I met up with 20 Malaysians at night. And uh, one of the students asked me, uh, YB, is this new Malaysia the same as the old Malaysia? Is there any real hope in this? The short answer is yes, there is hope, but it is also a process. The process is not expected to be easy. We are, in a sense, in a revolutionary position or situation, having overturned a government that has ruled for 60 years since independence. That is why the task at hand is monumental. Now, by engaging constructively, we can reform together, but we must be professional we must work hard and we must be extra vigilant. It is when all these plans are aligned that we will be able to witness the dawn of what I think to be the genuine new Malaysia. Thank you very much.